The 99 WMO report was not widely cited or relied on. However, the third assessment report obviously was. And the hockey stick was more or less its logo, appearing no less than seven times in different guises. It was even the backdrop for Houghton's press conference in Paris unveiling the report. After IPCC, the deletion of the decline became standard practice in spaghetti graphs. Uh, here, Briffa's 2001 articles are a bit schizophrenic, as he usually showed the decline in a standalone graphic, as in the one on the left, but then deleted it in the spaghetti version uh, shown at right. Uh, in this presentation shown here, Briffa did not use man's nature trick, and the dangling end is more visible but it still ends in 1960 and much of the decline is hidden. Briffa and others made labor attempts to rationalize the situation. In 2002, Briffa made the remarkable statement, what remark seems remarkable to me, that quote, in the absence of a substantiated explanation for the decline, we make the assumption that is likely to be a response to some kind of recent anthropogenic forcing. On the basis of this assumption, the pre-20th century part of the reconstruction is considered to be free of similar events and thus accurately represent past temperature variability. Mann's co-author Hughes drew an even more remarkable conclusion. He said that the di divergence problem proved that the re reconstructions were even more reliable than previously thought. I read Brif, uh, Hughes's quote in April 2003, and it was partly responsible for my present involvement in climate science. At the time, I, my interest was quite casual. When I read the above statement, I could hardly believe that this sort of thing passed as science in modern society. So I emailed Mann for the underlying data in the Mann reconstruction, then the big dog in the IPCC world, only for a man to tell me that he'd forgotten where the data was. This was the first step in what became a long road. Flash forward two years, May 2005, in the early days of climate audit, I read or reread the early Briffa articles, the ones that didn't hide the decline, and idly wondered why there was no corresponding decline in the IPCC. I blew up their spaghetti graph and noticed the truncation of the Briffa reconstruction, which is in green here, a truncation almost impossible to notice in the unzoomed version. I re-examined the IPCC text, verifying that it didn't disclose the truncation, uh, and wrote it up at Climate Audit. Climate Audit had a much smaller audience then than now, and the Post attracted only a few comments. In 2006, as many of you know, two blue ribbon panels looked at the controversy. Neither examined conduct issues. When Mann implausibly told the NAS panel that he didn't calculate the verification R2 statistic, as that would be a, quote, foolish and incorrect thing to do, the NAS panel sat there like bumps on a log. However, there were some interesting moments. Roseanne Dorigo astonished the NAS panel with a slide entitled Cherry Picking in which she attempted to rebut criticism of bias proxy selection by saying, you have to pick cherries if you want to make cherry pie. <laughs> she also presented a figure from her reconstruction which had a late 20th century discrepancy between proxies um, and temperature, though not as striking as in Briffa. Panelist Kurt Cuffey asked her about it. Dorigo answered, oh, that's the divergence problem. Cuffey reasonably wanted to know how you could rely on proxies to register past warm periods if they weren't picking up modern warmth. Dorigo could only say that the matter was being studied. <laughs> Richard Alley of Mann's soon-to-be employer Penn State was in attendance, saw the worried faces of the NAS panelists, and sent an urgent warning to key IPCC authors that the NAS panel might come down hard on the divergence problem. Overpeck had already heard about Dorigo's splash and hoped that Briffa had good answers. And Briffa and Cook were urgently requested to write the NAS panel. Briffa's answer probably didn't reassure the panel very much. He acknowledged that the issue needed work 
but pointed out that he was very busy with teaching and IPCC commitments and lacked fund for a research assistant to study the topic. He explained that as lead author of the relevant IPCC section, he decided not to, quote, overplay the issue because of its subtlety and that the problem remained insufficiently studied to be of much concern. <coughs> Cook acknowledged that it wasn't surprising that the panelists might come to doubt the value of the reconstructions, but called the doubt somewhat alarming. He conceded that doubt would be justified if the di divergence were due to natural causes, but he argued that the divergence was due to some still unknown anthropogenic cause. He, con he conceded that the lack of a known cause was unfortunate, but still thought this was insufficient grounds to question tree ring reconstructions. As in other parts of the report, the 2006 NAS panel made stronger statements in its text than in the overall spin. They conceded that the divergence problem reduced confidence in the correlation between rig widths and temperatures, but refrained from clearly stating the unavoidable corollary that, that called the tree ring reconstructions into question. For those of you who wonder about the thoroughness of these academic inquiries, NAS panel chairman Gerald North explained to a seminar at Texas A&M that they, quote, didn't do any research, that they got 12 people around the table and just kind of winged it, saying, that's what you do in this kind of expert panel. <laughs> Griffa definitely didn't overplay the um, divergence problem in the draft IPCC report. He didn't even mention it. Uh, Post-1960 values were, of his reconstruction were once again deleted. However, this time it did not pass on notice as I was an IPCC reviewer and made a sharply worded comment that the decline be shown and explained as best they could. This and other review comments occasioned an important, occasioned an important exchange in the summer of 2006. IPCC rules, which Overpeck had said were very strict in this regard, required reviewers to be registered and approved by IPCC. By June 2006, the comment period was over. Nonetheless, Griffa permitted Eugene Wall, a co-author of the team response to our articles and not even a registered reviewer, to insert changes to review comments and even to IPCC text that had been sent out to reviewers. The exchange was very surreptitious. Both Griffa and Wall emphasized the need for extreme secrecy the, this correspondence was later the subject of the no notorious delete all emails exchange. In May 2007, the uh, fourth assessment report was published. Once again, the decline was not shown. However, after 10 years, they conceded in the running text that the divergence problem would limit the possibility of reconstructing past warmth, a disclaimer that hardly compensated for not showing the discrepancy in the spaghetti graph. In 2000, June 2007, after a climate audit campaign, IPCC placed the review comments and author responses online, reversing their previous policy of restricting access to physical inspection at Harvard Library. We then got to see how the authors had justified not showing the decline. Griffa had merely said it would be, quote, inappropriate. Nothing more, no explanation, and no explanation about why it would be inappropriate to show actual data. In late 2007, climate audit reader David Holland noticed that IPCC procedures assigned its review editors the responsibility of ensuring that review comments were afforded appropriate consideration and that genuine controversies are reflected in the text. Holland wondered how Chapter 6 review editor Mitchell of the UK Met Office had discharged this obligation in respect to Briffa's refusal to show the decline and other unresponsive answers to review comments. Holland attempted to obtain Mitchell's comments first from IPCC, then from Mitchell, and ultimately through an FOI request to the UK Met Office. At first, U Mitchell and the Met Office implausibly said that Mitchell's correspondence had been deleted. Uh, when asked to search backups, the Met Office changed its story, now making the equally implausible claim that Mitchell had attended IPCC meetings in a personal capacity and not in connection with his employment and thus was not subject to FOI. 
when asked about expenses and salary, they changed the story once again, now claiming that production of the Mitchell emails would prejudice relationship between uh, UK and the international community, in, uh, the IPCC, and on its part, despite its supposed commitment to openness and transparency, the IPCC Secretariat refused to waive secrecy on Mitchell's comments. Holland also set a Freedom of Information request to CRU for any IPCC review correspondence that had been kept out of the official archive. Griffith's 2006 correspondence with Eugene Wall obviously fell in this category. Two days after Holland's request, Jones asked Wall, Griffith, Amon, and Amon to delete any uh, emails uh, pertaining to the fourth assessment report. Jones also emailed Briffa and FOI officer Palmer saying that Briffa should tell Palmer that he quote didn't get any additional comments other than those supplied by IPCC, a claim that is obviously contradicted by the wall correspondence. By 2009 these um, efforts had effectively stalemated him, then came climate gate. The trick email was spotted early on by Steve Mosher and was one of the first emails posted up on November 19th. Real Climate responded the next day saying that the emails merely showed people, quote, working constructively to improve joint publications and that the trick was merely science speak for a good way to deal with the problem. And for the most part, climate scientists seem to have adopted Real Climate's viewpoint. The trick spread like wildfire into the media, even prompting uh, video, its own video, Hide the Decline. Out of the early coverage, I thought John Stewart's take in The Daily Show was particularly acute. Um, I think I've got a clip. Can, can you play this clip? I guess we're not going to get it. Um, uh, Stewart, after um, quoting about Mike's nature trick, pauses and says, it means nothing. He's just using a trick to hide the decline. It's just scientists speak for using a standard statistical technique for calibrating data in order to trick you <laughs> into not knowing about the decline. <laughs> Uh, I urge you to uh, see Stewart's original. Um, to date, four inquiries have been set up. The first was uh, to report was Penn State. Penn State, like Stewart's satire, said that the trick was, quote, nothing more than a statistical method used to bring two or more different data sets together in a legitimate fashion by a technique that had been reviewed by a broad array of field peers in the field in order to trick you into not knowing about the decline. 